Welcome everyone to Linux Fest. This is John Humphrey. He's been working as a volunteer in fiber network industry for two years now. Two years, yeah. Thank you. Hi everybody. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Uh, thanks to Bellingham Technical College and Linux Fest for having me, allowing me to speak. Um, you know, this presentation um, I marked as easy because I've been giving this presentation all around town and um, I would assume today that most people are of a higher technical level, so um, I might kind of cruise through some of the slides a little more. This has been a... Um, an uphill battle. However, we have three council members. Now there's seven council members in the city of Bellingham for those guys who are out of town who at least agree with the dig once policy side of this. And I have a whole section on dig once. Um, so let me just get rolling here. Um, that's me and my stuff. <laughs> uh, so we say we should have done this already. Uh, I personally have over 25 years of IT experience. The only thing I've been doing longer than computers is music. I started doing music when I was 10. I started doing computers when I was 12. Um, you know, and that's um, that's you know some of my credentials. Um, I'm doing this as a volunteer. I start we uh, I started looking into this because I heard about other cities that were doing this, and I was like, this is the greatest idea ever. And then I started looking at the cost comparison and realizing that we were really being taken advantage of. Um, so, and a lot of that has to do with infrastructure. So these are the questions we're going to try to cover today. And, um, you know, is the internet a basic necessity? Um, I brought this keyboard so I can stand away from the podium. <laughs> uh, why, why should it be public? How much does it cost? Why haven't we done this already? And our current infrastructure and barriers to doing this. Um, so uh, is the internet a basic necessity? Pretty much everybody says yes. Um, and that's on both, both sides of the spectrum. It's seen as um, you know, an engine for economic development um, through um, a social justice issue. And it just depends on who you're talking to. But um, people pretty much agree people should have access to the internet. The question becomes what kind of access. And we look um, you know, on this chart here. Uh, Japan is paying about $25 a month for gigabit symmetrical connections right now. And we're over here. Of course, it depends on where you live. Um, because in some parts of the United States, people are in pretty good shape, right? Uh, so this is cost of gigabit uh, internet in other places. Kansas City, that's Google, by the way, is doing $70 a month. They have a new thing where after 12 months, if you just want to purchase equipment from them, there's a one-time equipment fee, and um, you get, I think it's like a 40 or 50 megabit symmetrical connection, which is their equivalent low-income connection. You just buy equipment, and you stay hooked up after 12 months with um, low bandwidth, a lower bandwidth. Uh, for us in Bellingham, a lot of us have 50, 10 connections, or you know, even slower than that, so even their free connection is um, you know, better than a lot, a lot of us are getting in Bellingham. Uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 68 a month for gigabit. They are doing now a $300 a month 10 gig service. So for guys in town that are paying um, you know, 250 a month for 100 megabits through um, you know, 900 a month for gigabit or whatever it is that they're paying, uh, depending on who they can get service from, and this is part of the problem. We have private providers in town, but not everybody has good access to them. Um, so Chattanooga, for what we're paying for 100 megabits, you would get 10 gig service. And that's because they made this investment in public infrastructure that I'm trying to convince the city of Bellingham to do. Not just me at this point. There's, thankfully, there's more than just me working on this <laughs> um, now. So I talked about this already. Japan, South Korea is a dollar less. Um, in general, in the other developed countries, in the 24 to 56 dollar a month range for gigabit, uh, Canada just defined their free standard as 50-10. And uh, ours is still defined by the federal government for high speed as 25-3. And it's a pretty low standard. Um, and I'll get to that when I get to the maps later about why that matters. Um, and I just talked about this in Bellingham. Uh, 
what one thing to note at this point is for some reason the Public Works Department has given me a cost for installing conduit of about four times what it costs in Phoenix, Arizona, a little more than four times what it costs in other neighboring cities. Um, even at that price, even at 400,000 a mile, um, it's still, Bellingham's only 29 square miles. So this still isn't an expensive project. I would like to know why, and I haven't gotten an answer from this yet, why it's... Geology here in the Northwest is really, you can run through sand, gravel, to mm -hmm. rock, and that's one of the reasons that okay. putting, like, just conduit can be really expensive here. Yeah, but we're, they quoted me 400000 a mile, which still seems pretty affordable, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, so I added this slide um, because a lot of the other presentations I do, people say, okay, I hate Comcast. I personally haven't met a person that likes, <laughs> that likes them yet. Um, I've met some people that are okay with it, uh, but their big concern is TV. They're like, what am I going to do about TV? Well, the service, everyone knows about all these other services on the right. The one I find that people don't know about is Pluto TV, if you haven't checked that out yet. It's a, f a free app. The way they pay for it is like old broadcast TV. They run commercials with programming, just like we used to do on Rabbit Ear and Tennis and stuff. That's how it's paid for, so it's free. And for a lot of people, that would completely, yeah. So there's also uh, YouTube uh, television. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, in Portland, for example, you can get sports on that. that yeah. That was previously like locked to Comcast. Mm -hmm. So the, lar the larger point I make on this slide is just that we are and have been past traditional TV for quite some time now. What we really need are good broadband connections. Um, so why should we do this? Creates good next generation jobs. Um, faster internet speeds um, are the thing that attracts them. It's also better for your quality of life. Uh, you get to have net neutral providers, period. Now, in the state of Washington, yes, we did pass the net neutrality law, but the big telecoms are already arguing federal preemption against it. Um, in the meantime, though, we have local providers uh, like Pogo Zone and Wave that have committed to net neutrality no matter what. But they can't get to us because we don't have conduit. <laughs> so um, uh, the educational advantages, there's a big social justice Part of this too, people, we call this the digital divide, which is also one of my big motivations for getting involved in this. People who have ready, good access to the internet and people that don't have access to educational opportunities, uh, people that do have access to educational opportunities that um, other people don't. And there is a lot of free educational opportunities um, on the internet now. The number one one that pops to mind is Khan Academy. Has everyone in here checked out Khan Academy at this point? Um, so it's good for the environment because it greatly reduces trips. Once you have really good bandwidth, you can effectively carry out meetings with lots of people at a fidelity that you can, um, you know, not have to put them on a plane to come to you, have them get in a car, that kind of thing. Um, again, I talked about digital divide issues a little bit. It helps address that. Um, I got an endorsement from the Young Democrats in Divisible Bellingham. Uh, Occupy Bellingham at this point. The list goes on. The more people I talk to about this, the more... Um, we're wondering why we haven't at least started putting conduit in. Um, but I will talk about that, too. <laughs> um, so some things that happened in Washington State recently. Um, we passed uh, this bill, which is really great because they used to define a rural area in Washington as 100 people or less, at least per square mile. And that meant that Mount Vernon, for example, who has a public fiber network, was able to get a bunch of grants to install it. Whereas we couldn't qualify for any of that stuff because even Whatcom County was like 101 people in the same amount of space. So that first one says that now the port can qualify for the same things and the port can start expanding. But the port is hardly the whole city. Right, um, it's good. It's good that and uh, Michael Shepard at the port really wants to expand this, so we'll, we should see some expansion out of the port pretty soon. But again, that's not the whole city, and it won't be the whole county. Um, and then, of course, we passed the net neutrality law, um, which is great. 
but uh, we already have federal preemption being argued against it, and that seems to me like something that we need to stop, right? Um, we need to, our, we live in America, we have a First Amendment, and um, I know this is the political side of this, but we should not have to worry about whether our providers are um, filtering traffic in any way or not. That's just, I shouldn't have to wake up and worry about that, right? None of us should. So that, we get the local providers with net neutral connections. It increases our um, self-reliance. It gives us more choice. The guys actually live in your town, so they care about it, right? Uh, CenturyLink came in with a little bit of fiber, for example. Uh, they're a Louisiana-based company. They have some guys up here doing installs, but they basically told us, unless they um, get a higher percentage than Comcast, that they um, won't give us a local office. Um, so the difference is in the kind of service that you'll get. JD from Pogo Zone lives a couple miles over that way, right? <laughs> you know, um, he lives in the town that you live in, and if you have a problem, you know, you're dealing with a neighbor. Yeah. Where do local providers get get their internet from, though? Um, is there a chance that they'll be throttled down? Uh, no, they, I mean, they purchase it from internet wholesalers, and it's really up to them how they deal with the bandwidth that they're given. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, Ultimately, it's CenturyLink. They're the ones that can terminate the fiber. Yeah. Unless we get our own fiber. Well, level 3 yeah. is down in Seattle, and I know there's a couple of chunks that are being... Mm -hmm. CenturyLink, yeah. Level three. Uh, you guys probably know all of these terms. Uh, I'll be talking about them throughout the presentation. If you'd like me to go over them, though, I, I will. Um, all right. So uh, we're talking about putting fiber optic cabling. Um, fiber optic cabling has a lot of advantages. It um, can be run greater distances. It's more reliable, and it can carry a whole lot of data. <laughs> Uh, the historical precedence for this is um, uh, the Rural Electrification Act. Oh, um, the, the other one I'm thinking of before I forget is Noel Communications does a lot of background work for purchasing. Um, you can purchase bandwidth from them and fiber as well. Uh, so the Rural Electrification Act, back in 1936, it was a federal <laughs> program. We had a lot of the same arguments we're having about broadband right now. Um, People criticize it for being unnecessary. We have private providers. Why do we have to give people electricity? Why do we have to give people in rural areas electricity? Um, you know, they can use candles if they need to read. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and people who really want it can get it if they pay a high price. And these are the same kind of arguments that we're hearing with broadband these days. Of course, we didn't run electricity to rural areas just entirely out of benevolence. We ran it out there so that farmers could be more efficient, so they could run more efficient tools. And that was better for everybody. That's how we produce five times the amount of food, one of the ways we produce five times the amount of food that we need is we built this critical infrastructure, we ran it virtually everywhere. And that's what we need to do with broadband. Yeah. Are these questions already answered or not? I believe they're rhetorical questions. Yeah, they're rhetorical. <laughs> yeah, this has, so this was already done. Yeah. Um, so we see that, um, you know, uh, the internets that a lot of people are paying attention to, Chattanooga, Tennessee, I've already mentioned that, $300 a month for 10 gig service, um, 68 a month for one gig service, is considered by many to be the best internet provider in the United States, and that is a public system. Uh, Mount Vernon has an open access system 20 minutes south of us. They've already started attracting businesses from Seattle who um, don't want to pay, you know, the rents on their buildings and stuff in Seattle but need high-tech service to run their businesses. And then this was a really cool talk I got to go to at the Broadband <coughs> Conference. The Tulalip Tribe installed all of their own fiber for, um, I'll grab you one second and just finish the point. Uh, they installed all their own fiber themselves. They were quoted $3 million by a private firm to do it. They did it as a community project for a tenth of that, for 300000 So um, we can do this, uh, especially in rural areas, as community projects as well. That would be more applicable to the county 
than the city, and I've mostly been working in the city, but I will go to the county, uh, hopefully, when we decide to, to set a Dig Once policy. <laughs> Yes. Um, have you been monitoring uh, what's been going on with Tacoma's uh, click fiber network? Mm -hmm. Oh, we have our own municipal fiber, but the utility owns it, and they're trying to sell it to Wave, or lease it to Wave. Mm -hmm. And it's just been a nightmare to try to get it back. Yeah, and that has happened. You know, there have the grand majority of cities, let me see if that map is next, that have done this have greatly benefited from it, but there have been a couple of sell-offs, and there have been, you know, uh, some things. I mean, we have, we're approaching 600 cities, I think, now that have done some sort of municipal broadband, and they, yeah, a handful of them haven't been successful, or it's been sold off, or that kind of thing, but, um, so these are the models. What we're after at this point is fiber to the home. There are some other ways to do it, right, um, you know, but uh, at this point, we should do fiber to the home. Actually, back during the Obama administration, I have the link to the article on this for guys who want to read it. We gave $400 billion to a lot of organizations, including, <coughs> yeah. We've actually been giving that money to them since the mid-90s. <laughs> mid-90s, yeah, okay. Um, I got 2008 in the article, but yeah, I'm sure that that's true because we were trying to do broadband rollout. Um, so we, we've given them so much money, we should have fiber. We should all have fiber connections by this point, but we don't. My historical reference is the Transcontinental Railroad. We have any history buffs in here? So during the Civil War, uh, as we may remember, uh, they decided to start work on the Transcontinental Railroad. And the companies involved in it said, oh man, they're gonna be too busy with this gigantic war that they're fighting, right, to notice what we're doing. So they put down a little bit of track and they ran away with the money. <laughs> um, but Lincoln actually uh, set a task force out in the middle of the war to hunt them down and make them start working on the railroad again. Um, so that's what we need to do. We need to find out where this money went, and we need to, um, you know, uh, hold the companies accountable for the installations that haven't been done. Good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, our current plan seems to be to give them the money again right now. But hey, maybe you know, maybe the second time it'll work out. Because they're paying the lobbyists. <laughs> they're paying Congress. Um, so I want to talk about this because um, our public works director is very into wireless. He says, why not wait for wireless? Um, well, in order, number one, yeah, I mean, everyone uses cell phones. Everyone's going to want better wireless. I get all that. Um, but you need to back up all these small cells with fiber. You know, there's, uh, so the idea that we can just skip this step of putting the conduit in and running the fiber in the whole nine is ludicrous. We need real infrastructure to support, real telecommunications infrastructure to support any telecommunications thing that we do. Um, so there's a great book called The 5G Myth, a lot of you guys might like, that talks just about the wireless technologies and um, how they actually work. Uh, we're throwing away our cell phones about every 18 months in the United States right now but most of us haven't even experienced the speed we should be getting out of 4G in the first place. 4G is capable of doing 300 megabits symmetrical, so that's about six times faster down and um, 30 times faster up than a lot of you guys are getting on your home connections. Yes? The uh, email you sent out with a link that shows you how much speed you're mm -hmm. getting, well, I couldn't figure out how to do it, but it's a good link, isn't it, to figure out how what we're getting right now. Yeah. And the other thing about cell phone networks is, of course, it's all shared among everyone that is using that node, including <laughs> the gap time between devices talking because you can't all talk at the same time. Right, so legally to say you have a 5G connection, all you gotta do is put up one of these things and hook some fiber up to it and have a 5G you know, uh, antenna on it. After that, you can say you have 5G service. But that, there's a big difference between doing that and doing it correctly and backing it up with enough fiber and. You know, um, I'd also say in a populous area, you run out of spectrum before, like, oh, long. which yeah, which is why they want to go into higher <coughs> bandwidth spectrum. Um, so, but you know, the director of community broadband networks, he has talked to our city council, and they're significantly less reliable. I mean, it's not that they aren't cool. It's not that you know, yeah. How is this you know, wireless you're talking about here? Is this similar to like what's going on with the Detroit Community <coughs> Technology Project? Yeah. Is that Detroit's no, doing no. mesh, aren't they? They're just doing, they're a, doing mesh. a mesh network. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This this is this um, 
coming 5G thing that's millimeter yeah. waves, supposed to be super fast. Yeah. But there are many obstacles. Well, I mean, threats to federalize it, too. What's and that? that's just and Wi-Fi. threats to federalize it. Right. And this is mobile, cellular technologies. Too. Yeah. Apples and oranges. Right. Mm. <laughs> so, um, so I'm not talking about this, this little thing you have in your home. That's fine. I'm talking about the large stuff and the small cells that I already showed. Um, and let's see. Can you can you stop on that one? On this one, yeah. Or which one? Yeah, this one. So I already talked about most of the stuff in here. Um, the, like I said, the. Uh, they're, they're saying they want to wait for wireless. Uh, the COB is saying, our public works director, that he believes 5G will solve pretty most of our problems. Well, but well, One of the biggest problems with wireless is that the bandwidth that you have to get to is already sold to the proprietors we already have. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and there are ways yeah. to free up bandwidth and repurpose things. That's all covered in the 5G myth. Um, I thought I had heard that there was some sort of a planning meeting on, wire, on uh, fiber in the last two weeks. There was. I'm going to talk about that on April 23rd. There was. Uh, so can I interject one yeah. thing? I call uh, wireless the bottled water of internet. You know, mm -hmm. it's more expensive. It doesn't have as much capacity. And yeah, um, and you need the fiber to do it anyway. Yes. Um, so more importantly, you need fiber to do wireless anyway. <laughs> So no matter the solution, uh, it needs to be public because basically whoever controls this conduit and this fiber um, is going to control how communications happen. Um, anyone can lease on conduit, like uh, you know down in Skagit, um, I've been told that Wave likes to run their own fiber, so they just lease conduit. Pogo Zone though leases some of the public fiber down there, and so this, it just gives you a lot more choices and a lot more um, flexibility with how to do networking. The analogy I like better is to compare fiber to roads. That, that's yeah. definitely a much better analogy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so right, so we're building this public infrastructure that everybody uses so that they can get their work done on a daily basis, do the things that they need to do. And we did that with the road system. Um, so, so also when they claim the performance that they do out of uh, on a wireless, they're usually talking about um, line of sight communications, um, you know, and uh, Pogo Zone has quoted me that they can get, you know, get a gigabit connection, but I would have to put a wireless dish on my roof pointing at their dish, and in my case, there's too many trees in the way. Um, <laughs> there are also some concerns with, uh, with millimeter uh, wavelength, but um, I would much prefer just to have be able to hook up to fiber for a reasonable cost in my home. Um, so this isn't this presentation is directly about net neutrality. I've, oh, you sorry. Didn't wanna, you didn't even mention that there are really far more privacy and security issues with wireless. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, and this you know I'm trying to get through this all mm -hmm. in. An hour, but um, yeah, we could talk about VPN connections and encryption, and you know, all these other kind of ways to protect your data. Um, net neutrality, though, um, has been in the news, right? And uh, it's not this presentation not directly about net neutrality, um, but building publicly owned networks will help us main, maintain net neutrality permanently because it'll give us a permanent choice, right? If a provider argues against net neutrality for whatever reason we can go to a public provider. We can go to another provider. We can go to a provider that guarantees net neutrality no matter what. Um, so, and that's how this fits into um, a publicly owned network. Um, there's a co-op that's trying to get going called HamsterNet. You guys can check it out on Facebook if you like. Um, so the model in the open access model um, allows for all different kinds of companies as well. So you don't have to do business with a private company necessarily. Um, you can do business with a co-op. Now in the state of Washington, we do have a weird law, and this is why we need to have a third party in between. In the state of Washington, unless you can make an argument that there is no other equivalent service in your area, 
your um, PUD or municipality can't directly provide you with service. That's why a lot of towns are starting to create co-op internet services, which is perfectly legal. Um, in a city like Bellingham, we all rate, we will have a mixture of um, services right off the bat, but especially in the rural areas, their best bet um, would be to create a co-op or something along those lines. Um, and net neutrality doesn't raise the cost of your connection. Um, it's, the, it's the simplest way to route traffic is just, you know, not to prioritize traffic. <laughs> so. Uh, Nielsen's Law, so people say, well, we don't really need this, and we're always kind of being told what we do and don't need. Um, but kind of like with Moore's Law, where computing power doubles about every 18 months, uh, users' bandwidth need grows about 50% per year. So, and especially with VR and a lot of these other high bandwidth things hitting the market, um, our need for bandwidth is not going to go away, right? So we need to prepare for it and be ready for the future, or we will not be able to compete with other cities around us economically, uh, which will be bad, right? <laughs> um, so we have already paid for, and the city already has um, a public, uh, public fiber network. However, they maintain it for their own use. Um, and I'll get to the maps for that in a second. Why public? Um, well, we've already paid for it. They say it is and isn't useful. They say they can and can't find some of it. I'll talk about all that in a second. Um, but again, you know, this is a list from the Community Broadband Network site of all the places that have done this. Uh, Washington has done a lot of it, but the reason it's in red are because of the laws I was just talking about that we. Uh, have these laws that make it difficult to do a direct municipal connection, that you have to put a co-op or something in between. Um, so, you know, this has happened before in history. At a certain point, making private services uh, public just makes sense, right? Um, we mentioned roads already, uh, fire service. The internet, and originally DARPAnet, was a government project, right? So uh, fire service I like the most because you get this image of if everyone didn't pay for their fire service, your neighbor's house could catch on fire and eventually catch your house on fire if they didn't pay for their fire, fire service or vice versa. So we get to a point where um, it just makes sense to make these services public uh, so that we don't end up you know, creating situations that we don't need to. Do, do those... Um situations where they've gone public, do those states have the same laws that Washington does? No, a lot of the other states can just do direct municipal if they want to, yeah. That it would be great to allow, to get the laws changed so we could in Washington. And I've talked to the governor's office about that and they're supposed to try, but we'll see what happens. Now we're on to the thing we're working on right now um, that I think we have a reasonable chance of getting pushed through, uh, you know, in the near future as a dig once policy. And um, all dig once policy says is whenever we do a repair, like a road repair, we're just gonna put in a two inch plastic pipe that allows us to run fiber through it if we want to. That pipe can be leased by companies that wanna do that. It would also make a lot of sense for us to put in publicly owned fiber when we did that as well. Uh, but the number one thing really is just getting this conduit in place every time we do a repair. Um, so that we can, um, so that we can move <coughs> forward, you know, with internet choice and broadband and modernize our city. Yeah. And it just makes a lot of sense because you already had to tear up the road to do it. <laughs> yeah. It costs you so very much little to do that extra. Right. And so much more to go back and do it when that's the only right. Thing. And that is the way we do it now, right? Um, every time a repair is going to be made, we dig the road back up. This is the most cost-effective way to do repairs. We plan ahead, we make a part of our strategic plan, and we say, hey, every time we dig up a road, we're just putting a, a two-inch pipe in. The city leases it, so the city makes money back on it. This is how Mount Vernon started, 125 grand initially for their network. Their network did very well, so they took out another 500,000, paid for that, and this has happened in most of the cities that have done this. The network pays for its own expansion because um, you just strategically do it, right? You, um, you say every time we dig up a row, we're putting this in. You actually keep track of it. And then you start connecting things together and how a network works, right? We all 
we all get that. So. Um, a single two-inch conduit serves. It's it's basically sufficient for the future for multiple connections. So yeah, so a single two-inch conduit could fit 867 strands of fiber. Each one of those strands can carry multiple wavelengths. They keep getting better at generating the wavelengths and using the fiber. And you, you can pull some and have company come in later, rent it, pull some more. It doesn't yeah, matter. but you also don't always have to change out the fiber. You can get, get better at carrying wavelengths yeah. too, so it's, yeah, um, it's a good idea. All right. Uh, why hasn't it been done already? Uh, I kind of mentioned this already, and part of my French, we kind of have done it in a half-assed way. We have um, this city network that, uh, uh, you know, that um, they've lost track of resources and blah, 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 but it does exist. It serves things like the schools and the libraries and other municipal things. Um, and I think the map is next. Yeah, so this was the map that was released about two years ago, and I got very excited and they're very unexcited in a few seconds later because they released a new map that in some ways is even worse. Um, this map, you notice, is good because it gives us a sense of where the fiber network is, and it runs a huge part of the city. However, this map doesn't list the kind of things you would expect to see. Like, it doesn't list conduit sizes, it doesn't list fiber counts. Um, so, we asked for those things in a public records request. And, uh, actually, let me jump ahead and then come back to this. And we were stonewalled for a while, and the city's attorney was told he was all, could take a picture with his phone of this hand-drawn map. <laughs> this is supposedly, that's, I call it the Knight Rider map. Because, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's probably a very accurate map, but you can see here that, you know, uh, things just aren't being updated like they should be. Um, so they finally released this map. And this map standard, the dark blue areas, by the way, are using uh, Agit Pi's current federal standard, which is a 25 megabit down, three up connection is considered high speed. Anything below that, um, they also list on the map, which they're considering you, if you have a connection that's virtually worthless, it's basically equivalent to saying someone has a car because they have a car on blocks in their yard, right? That is still on this map. This map still does not list conduit size, fiber counts, anything. It instead lists what telecom providers the city believes you have access to. <laughs> so it's basically a telecom advertisement map created by our city. Uh, that's what they released for the April 23rd meeting this Monday. Um, which this April 1st. <laughs> <laughs> so we um, did attend the meeting about, I think, I see some people here that are there. I think it's probably like 15, 15 to 20 people, somewhere around that range. We had eight, people, seven or eight people speak about Dig Once, um, and you know, they they were they did discuss it in a closed session at 1:50 that day. Closed sessions the public can attend, but is not allowed to make any commentary at. They received no commentary from any impartial telecom experts. Um, so that is part of the barrier that we've been running into is that we have these three city council members that are interested, but they understandably keep going back to their staff for expertise. And the staff keeps saying, hey, man, we got a 25-3, man. That's, you ever drive a 25-3 car? That thing just goes, right? And that's, uh, <laughs> and that's you know, the kind of feedback they're getting. I think as of uh, Monday, though, they really understand that we need something better, and I'm really thankful that all those people showed up and talked on Monday. You guys can see the video on the City of Bellingham website. Um, about 26 minutes in uh, are when the public fiber guys start talking. Yeah. You know how much bandwidth an 8K TV show takes? I think it was quoted at 300 megabits. Yeah, sounds about right. Yeah. Put them on 25.3 connections and give all their children tablets to Netflix. Yep. <laughs> um, so, I already jumped ahead to that and went back. So, our infrastructure in general, like we've been talking about, it's not great. Puget Sound Energy owns 70% of the poles. Uh, they charge $600 a pole to lease them. So, right, and right now that there is some aerial fiber being done, uh, you know, I believe it's a uh, 
Uh, Century League now owns most of the rest of the 30 percent, and uh, we and the city owns a bunch of street lights and stuff that they pull fiber into. So our big problem is that we don't have a good way to distribute this, right? Um, the PSC cost is just too high for those poles. A lot of the poles aren't in great shape, um, so we need to make a real investment in infrastructure. Except per month or per year? Uh, annually. Yeah. So single pole. Single pole. That's interesting. Can I, in Oregon, it's uh, the pole attachments are one dollar per pole per month. So it's a twelve week. So okay. Okay. So that's three sixty five, right? That's half the price. It's too, it's too much. So yeah. Right? Well, it also means if you're a telecom company, if you don't think you're going to get a bunch of connections, you're not going to go lease a bunch of poles for Puget Sound Energy. Like, you have to have a certain minimum number of people in that neighborhood to make it worth mm. running anything in the first place. Mm. So, yeah. Telcos have lobbyists. Are you working <laughs> with them? Um, so... The public is your lobbyist, right? Yeah, I've you know I've been I've been kind of focusing on fellow citizens and that exactly. kind of thing. But I mean, sure. you you've really taken charge here in Bellingham with this. Correct? Yeah, but I have more support now, thankfully. But yeah, I was the guy who really started about two years ago. Yeah. Um. So when I say this, this is actually really a commentary on our local government, and I should have specified that uh, when the lo when our local government gets advice, the guys they've met with really in the last five years, they met with Comcast to negotiate a franchise agreement, talk about broadband a little bit. Um, they met with CenturyLink. They've met with Verizon. Technically, the city can only regulate cable TV connections, so it's one of the reasons they require a, fr a cable TV franchise agreement. Um, you know, Gene Knutson, I did an interview with him, one of the city council members, and he was saying that, you know, it's a bad situation that in a lot of ways this is all that they can get out of the, out of, uh, the, out of the big telecoms is these franchise agreements because the big telecoms could come in here and do whatever they feel like by state law. And that's one of those things that we have to change or we could just build public infrastructure and stop doing business with them, which would be, you know, better. Um, <laughs> So this is our public works director, Ted Carlson. That's our mayor, Kelly Linville. I've talked about them and you know their feelings on uh, broadband. Um, I'm finally supposed to be talking on the phone to uh, Mayor Linville within the next couple months. And she is finally meeting with one other expert. Um, but you know a lot of it, in her case, I think it was just lack of interest in technology. Um, in Ted's, I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah. <coughs> She recently uh, talked with the mayor um, in Mount Vernon. Uh, you might want to uh, follow up on that with mm -hmm. her. Um, I will. Yeah, when we talk, we're supposed to talk about broadband. So, but in particularly with the mayor of Mount Vernon. Well, you know, a bunch of our council members met with the IT director of Mount Vernon as well a couple months ago, and they came back saying fibers and inevitability. We need to do this. Um, the, so, the situation in Tacoma, we had the biggest barrier being the utility board, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the city council ended up being on our side mm -hmm. after they realized, hey, we already have fiber in the ground. It's amazing, we just need to upgrade the ends because we mm -hmm. got it put in as part of a smart meter system. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, keeping the, pr the price down. We're saving nine million uh, because Comcast can't sell as high as they do in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just been, there's been a very, very powerful lobbying force of big ISPs that don't like us. So that mm -hmm. has been our biggest barrier. They've gotten in bed with the utility, and that's just something to be aware of because it's, you know, it's been Comcast, it's been mm -hmm. CenturyLink. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's. So yeah. So we talked about this already. The meetings that they've had. Uh, we've been trying to meet with them, the public fire people. We've tried to meet with them for two years. This actually started back in 1994. Uh, John Survey. The guy who runs NW Citizen, where I release most of my fiber articles, by the way, um, nwcitizen.com, if anyone wants to read them, um, initially approached the city in 1994 about an idea like I'm talking about today and received the same kind of resistance. So it's not that they haven't had the time, it's not that they don't know about it, it's, um, it's not that they don't have the staff or any other excuses we've heard. They've known about it since 1994. So. 
Um, I've just been more aggressive about it than anybody else. Um, you know, our barriers on the local level, <laughs> need I say more, uh, other than to note that that's, if you don't know, that's Agit Pie on the right. Um, oh yeah, we know. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, some good news though, like I said, we have some council members that are finally starting to listen. Uh, the city had their policy analyst, Mark Gardner, present a very favorable report all the way back in November. Um, at that meeting, um, Community Broadband Network Skyped in. It was a historical event for Bellingham. It was the first time the city of Bellingham has had a Skype meeting in the council chambers. Um, so uh, the writing's on the wall. The real question is whether we're going to do this in enough time uh, to be able to compete with the other towns around us. I've been talking with Spokane recently. Spokane's starting to look into this, right? The San Juans have done um, a co-op. You know, uh, Canada is guaranteeing a 50-10 connection as a basic human right, more than twice the speed of that 25-3 map we saw a couple frames ago. They're a huge economic competitor to us. We're geographically located. Mount Vernon has a public fiber network. <coughs> the list goes on and it keeps getting bigger. So the real question is, will we wait another 10 years and have to do this anyway without being able to attract business from Seattle and the whole nine, or will we, will we finally just do it? You know, uh, the conduit doesn't cost really anything like we've talked about. So, um, so the conclusion is though we need to ask them for it. Um, until recently, until Monday, they thought it was just me and two other guys talking about it. Um, even though I have a petition um, online, and I went uh, on one of the slides that it's at change.org, Bellingham Public Fiber. Um, please sign it. It's, uh, it shows that we have numbers, right? We're at almost 1,500 signatures at this point. They're pretty much all local. It shows that it's not just a bunch of super geeks that are interested in this, part of my French. It shows that it is a big portion of the community, right? And um, that is something that they'll, that they'll listen to, our government. Yes? So ever since I saw John speak uh, a few weeks ago, I got excited about this issue because I'm really into public versus private. And we've had him speak once at a Leopold, and we had about maybe 10 people show up. And since then, everywhere I go, I'm talking about this issue. You know, standing in line at the grocery store, talking to clerks, my friends. Nobody knows about this issue. And I, you know, why isn't the city, I said that at the council meeting, why aren't they having some forums to alert the public and have an open discussion? Mm -hmm. And you know, we're talking again, we're talking about orders of magnitude in difference of speeds for what we're paying. I pay $104 a month for my Comcast connection. They say I have up to 250 megabits down and 10 up. And they never give you a good up speed. And a guy like me, I could, really use a decent connection with my, with my knowledge, right? Um, but the other side of it is, for what I'm paying a month, I would, be get, I would be paying less and getting a gigabit in all these other cities in the United States, $70 a month. Um, you know, in Japan, I'd be getting like 10 gigs, and people say, well, you can't, you can't compare the United States to Japan. You can't make international comparisons. Why not? We trade internationally, right? There, uh, there's no reason a software company, the compiler doesn't care, there's no reason a software company has to set up here um, instead of, instead of um, you know, Europe or Japan or anywhere else. Um, you know, it, the technological advancements have largely broken down barriers between countries. And that, I think, is mostly a really good thing. But the other side of it is, if we don't start catching up with infrastructure, why, why come to Bellingham instead of Kansas City, right? Why come to Bellingham instead of Mount Vernon? Why come to Bellingham instead of Chattanooga um, if you're a high-tech company? Why move out of Seattle and come to Bellingham instead of Mount Vernon? Right now, we are not, even though we have a huge, I mean, we have, uh, what is it, three pinball arcades, one console arcade, two regular arcades. We have Bellingham Technical College, Western. I mean. We have Faith Life. We have we have a lot of really big tech here and a lot of really skilled technology workers. 
but we don't have a network that represents them well. Um, and what they could do with it, um, I can't even imagine it would be all good, right? So, yes? The real barrier that you're facing is lack of understanding in your city government. Mm -hmm. You can't, if you, were, if you were successful in getting this passed against their objections, basically forcing it down their throat, it would go down to failure because they will not hire and fund and staff people to administer this network reasonably well. It will go down to failure, it will be cited as a, as a failure and ripple through, and it will ultimately be sold to the people who are willing to hire competent tech professionals. It's 2018. They should have more sense than that by now. We've made a very good argument. But you know, they, they can't, they, 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 should. they, they don't yeah. understand. They, yeah, no, just, technological education is a huge barrier. If we had good technological education in our culture, people wouldn't tolerate and in, and, in, and in another generation, you will. Those, those will come up right now. Yeah, but we can't wait another generation. Like, we can't, you know. Or is, the barrier, is the real barrier the electeds or the civil servants? Um, <laughs> the electeds well, that, that hire the civil servants. Well, it, some of the elect, it's a mixture. A TED is definitely a barrier, or a public works director. Um, the rest of the guys, I, I think they just do what they're directed to do. In the city council, um, you know, we have the three supporters, we have a couple people that um, just haven't taken the time to understand it, and um, then we have one council member that just thinks it's silly. So. Is it less work to just push for getting new city council members? <laughs> uh, I laugh because we just had an election, we had a ton of people that supported this, like Jean Layton, mm -hmm. and she um, got beat out by Roxanne Murphy. So we can do it in a couple years again. But um, I feel like we need to get moving on this sooner than that. But yes, ultimately we need city council members that um, they get, under, they, they got, get it. Yeah. Who are the three? Um, we have Pinky Vargas, Michael Lilliquist, and Gene Knudsen. Gene and Michael are on the Public Works Commission. So the only third person on the Public Works Commission is Terry Bonerman. And uh, he is kind of 50-50 on it. If Terry was um, you know, made to understand the issue, they're basically the people directing the Public Works Department right now. Because um, they break into committees, you know, and each committee usually has three people and that kind of thing. And that's currently the Public Works Commissioner, those three guys. So, yeah. Uh, I don't know around here, so I don't know the, the, the barriers, mm -hmm. but why do you need the city council? I mean, you can have a co-op, right? And co-op can do it. And, and what, 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 city council can't dig without them, or, or what, what? Right. We need basically we just need we need the city council to approve putting in conduit every time they do a street repair. Okay. That's where they fit in. There, there. We have an open access model. There, what they do is actually not very much. All the city has to do is put conduit in. But the providers that use the conduit, they take care of the maintenance, they take care of the customer service calls, they take care sure, of everything. Sure, so, but so. Count, uh, so Comcast and the other telecoms around here, mm -hmm. they certainly didn't meet council resolution, right? No, they, they're using uh, mostly aerial poles and, uh, you know, yeah. All right, so thank you. Yeah, cool. Well, some of us are thinking of this as a social justice issue and a human rights issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Terry Bornham is hugely sensitive rights. to those kind of issues. So mm -hmm. um, if more of us maybe call and talk to him. But did you talk about how this was good for marginalized and poor people? Oh, no. Good point. So, yes, this, uh, of course, digital divide issues hit our poor and minority communities much harder than anybody else. They just really don't have access. And that means that the amount of access they have to the educational opportunities um, are, also, are also less. With a public network, we can give people real broadband connections. Uh, the low income connections the big telecoms are providing up here are, are a joke. I mean, I think there's seven megs down and .768, not even a full meg of it, .768 up. They're virtually worthless. No one's going to be able to learn on a connection like that. Well, the other uh, great argument that we've been able to use in Tacoma is how much money is saved by yeah. having a type of public option. Mm -hmm. The last numbers were $9 million a year for ratepayers, just because 
uh, Comcast can't charge as much. Yes. And so just that, that, that flat out ability to keep uh, all the private providers at reasonable prices, where up in Seattle, you know, they would kill for a fiber option, because that would save millions. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, so what, what are the next steps? The next steps right now are pushing for Dick once. That's the thing I think we can achieve pretty quickly. Yeah, Contacting your council members, you know, getting the word out, signing the petition, Dick, pushing specifically for Dick once. My one comment is to make sure that if we get the conduit in, if they're going to lease the conduit, make sure that they don't just kill the public option mm -hmm. by charging too much. Because in Seattle, one of the problems with having municipal or even fiber networks mm -hmm. is the city of Seattle, they charge $300 to touch a pole and then it's 300 a month mm -hmm. to have anything on a pole. It's just, it starts making it uneconomical to even string, string the fiber. Right. I wish that one woman was here today that was talking about the health issues. Oh, yeah, there, uh, you're going back to wireless. There are some, um, you know, I've, here's my comment on that. I've said, I think you would have to climb a pole and stick your face in between the emitters for a while for it to be a problem. My concern is with the removal of the land use policy, which allows them to put the small cells wherever they feel like. That's what seems crazy about it to me. Um, so I think we could do some deployment, but we have to be careful about it, like any new technology. We have to do our research, and we're not. We're just rolling the stuff out without it, and that is concerning. Well, if it was in the ground, it wouldn't be emitting. Right, fi fiber is perfectly safe. Yeah, so. yeah fiber is sure. Yeah, real good. Anna Cordes is uh, putting in a network through right. the water pipes. Mm -hmm. and I believe in Detroit, they're, they're putting it through the sewer system. That's one of the options that they're supposed to discuss that we've recommended as well. There are other cities that have used even abandoned sewer pipes and stuff to do it because, you know, I mean, they're not suitable for water work, but the fiber, yeah, they're the perfectly there. suitable for fiber, so yeah. There's, there are some issues with repair with uh, sewer pipes. Yeah. You've got to, if you need to replace the sewer pipe, there's a cape bundle of fiber going through it. How do you get the fiber into the new section of pipe? Mm -hmm. The same way they do it when somebody digs up the cable at today. <laughs> but they've got to, they have to cut it. I think what it comes a contract that does it on a regular basis. I think what it comes down to is we have the people with the expertise, we have the equipment. Um, you know, there's a good argument to do it, um, and we just need to put some pressure on them and, and get it done. Yeah, there are. You know, you're right. There are going to be some things that are more or less difficult to service, but. I think it's pretty obvious this is a resource that we need in the modern Absolutely. world. So, so we shouldn't look at the repairs as an expense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. John, is there a way for people to, if they sign up?